Hi, my name is Dr. Catherine Hughes from Crime Psych. I'm a criminal psychologist and I run a business that enables me to bring knowledge and learning to everyone, not just those who are studying at colleges or universities. And I do this by producing a range of blogs, vlogs and free online courses. I do also run some slightly more in-depth courses, which are both available face to face and online. You don't need any previous qualifications to learn with me. And there are a range of subjects available. So once you've finished watching this video, head on over to my website and take a look at those to see if any of those interest you. This particular video is looking at John Christie from Halifax in the UK. Christie murdered at least eight people, including his wife. He was actively killing in the late 1940s, early 1950s. He killed all of his victims by strangling them in his flat at 10 Rillington Place, Notting Hill in London. Therefore, they're more commonly known as the Rillington Place murders. As with all of the psychological analyses that I do, I begin by taking a look at the early life and the upbringing of the offender. And this is because there are usually always some events or trauma in their lives before they even begin offending or, in this case, killing. At the beginning of writing this analysis, it dawned on me just how many of the analyses that I've done include poor parenting or disruptive behaviour and abuse. And this led to me writing a three-part series which examines attachment styles and how attachments form and can influence behaviour later in life. This includes looking at how birth order can affect personality. Christy was born into a large family and he was the sixth of seventh children. His father was a controlling man and he didn't show any emotion towards his children. He would regularly punish the children for minor things. Christie's mother and older sisters, they would alternate between being overly loving and overly affectionate and coddling him to being verbally abusive and ordering him around. The mix of controlling and loving behaviours is very confusing for a child. A child becomes eager to please their parents, but often don't know how to. Christie's father was um, very authoritarian and he didn't show any affection towards his children. Authoritarian parents only allow one-way communication. And this is because they use statements such as, because I said so, as the reason behind rules. Children are expected to blindly obey without questioning. They're not allowed to have a voice or to even voice their opinions. Children are often seen and not heard. Children whose parents, parents who have an authoritarian parenting style, can be insecure and apprehensive. Authoritarian parents also impose tight psychological control over all of their children. They believe that they, the parents, are the authorities who are always right. Their children, they think, they need to accept their judgment and values at all times without question. Authoritarian parents rely on a child's sense of fear towards their parents to exert some psychological control over them. This style of parenting from the father, combined with the mixed messages from his mother and his sisters, are likely to have caused a great deal of psychological distress in Christie. This is likely to have led to a fearful avoidance style of attachment as he grew into adolescence. Fearful attachment patterns are demonstrated by those possessing an unstable or a fluctuating view of themselves and of other people. Those who knew Christie as a child described him as, and as I quote, a queer lad who kept himself to himself. They also say he was not very popular. He will have had difficulty forming and maintaining relationships because he wasn't able to predict how he would be treated. This leads to that person becoming quiet or withdrawn from relationships. It's also reported that Christie's grandfather was an authoritarian as well. And this is probably why his father was. We tend to copy what we see and learn how to behave from our parents. When his grandfather died, 
Christie said that seeing his grandfather's body laid on a trestle table gave him a feeling of power and well-being. This was a man who he once feared and now he was only a corpse and that's in Christie's words. This is a very telling statement from a psychological point of view. What Christie is actually saying is that feelings of fear and helplessness can be turned into positive emotions once that person is dead. The negative becomes positive through death. Because this is a significant moment for him, he would have internalised this feeling. It is possible that this belief was subconsciously driving his later murderous behaviour. Christie was a very intelligent person with an IQ of 128. Most people have an IQ of between 85 and 115. Therefore, he attained good results in school. However, he lacked the social skills to mix and to make friends. His first attempts at sex were difficult. He was unable to have an erection. This wasn't because of any known medical conditions that he had. It's very likely to have been a psychological problem. This is unsurprising as the relationships that he's had with females were turbulent with mixed messages behind them. As I have already mentioned, his mother and his sisters would alternate between being overly loving and affectionate and coddling him to being verbally abusive and ordering him around. He would have wanted to please them and he would have enjoyed the feelings of being loved and coddled by them. However, this would make it even more damaging and hurtful when they did verbally abuse him. He wasn't able to predict how he would be treated, meaning that he would have been very apprehensive in getting too close to other females who were only likely to hurt him in future. His peers knew that he had difficulty in getting an erection on that occasion and they would bully him by calling him names such as Reggie No Dick and Can't Do It Christy. In his adult life, he's, his difficulties with sex continued and most of the time he could only perform sexually with prostitutes. This is further evidence of what I've just said. He was paying for sex. He knew what he was going to get out of it and he didn't have to try and guess how to please them or to be fearful of how they would treat him or maybe even reject him. At the age of 15, he was enlisted in the army. He was involved in a mustard gas attack and he claimed to be temporarily blinded and temporary muteness that lasted over three years. Although some believe that his loss of speech was simply a means to gain attention. Following this, he claims that he was only able to talk with a whisper. He went on to marry Ethel Simpson. However, his sexual difficulties continued and he continued to use prostitutes. Early in the marriage, Ethel suffered a miscarriage. They separated after four years of marriage. Christie, who'd become a postman, was sent to prison then for three months for stealing postal orders. By the age he was 29, he was back in prison on theft charges and he spent nine months incarcerated before moving in with a prostitute. He then served a further six months inside for assaulting her. He's also suspected of assaults on other women as well, but no charges were brought. A further spell in prison for car theft followed, after which he asked his wife Ethel to come and live with him in London again, which she did. Before he'd killed anyone, he'd been in trouble with the law. He had been violent towards women. He is likely to have resented women a great deal. I think, personally, that it's possible he thought moving in with a prostitute at the time that he did would mean that he would be able to have a satisfying relationship. After all, he was able to have intercourse with prostitutes. But when he found that his difficulties in the bedroom continued, he became violent towards her. This violence is likely to stem from feelings of frustration in Christy. It was around the time when they moved to London into the infamous 10 Rillington Place. At this time, 
it was a rundown area of London, which was being poorly maintained. He applied and was accepted into the War Reserve Police as they didn't check his criminal record before they employed him. Christie committed his murders over a 10-year period between 1943 and 1953, usually by strangling his victims after he'd rendered them unconscious with domestic gas. Some he raped as they lay unconscious. The method of killing shows that he didn't want any confrontation with his victims. He only killed them once they'd become unconscious. Once he'd exerted his power over the victims, he then raped them. This is likely to be either consciously or subconsciously linked to power and control and their submission to satisfying and pleasurable feelings, which was sexual. Christie's first known victim is Ruth Forrest. She was a 21-year-old Australian girl. She supplemented her income by occasionally engaging in prostitution. Christie claimed to have met her while she was soliciting clients in a snack bar. According to Christie's own statement, he invited her back to his home to engage in sex. Afterwards, Christie strangled her on his bed with a length of rope. The second of Christie's victim was a work colleague that he lured to his house, claiming that he could cure her bronchitis. He made her unconscious with gas and then raped and strangled her. These first two victims, he buried them in his back garden. Christie's next victims were his neighbours in 1948. Timothy Evans and his wife Beryl moved into one of the flats in Rillington Place and soon Beryl gave birth to a baby girl, Geraldine. Evans had an IQ of 70 and he was an impressionable man because of this. He also possessed a violent temper. His learning difficulties made it really hard for him to get a steady job and when a year later Beryl found herself pregnant again, she feared that she wouldn't be able to support another child. After some botched um, self-abortion attempts, Christie claimed to have some knowledge of abortion which was illegal in the UK at the time. Beryl became his third victim. He strangled and raped her but he told Evans, her husband, that she died from sepsis because of the other methods that they'd used to try to abort their baby. Therefore, Evans didn't inform the police of his wife's death. Evans even went to his aunts and Christy convinced him that he'd found a couple to look after their couple's existing baby. But as we know now, he also killed the baby. Christy knew that this man was going to be easily manipulated because of his low intelligence. Evans did eventually tell the police that she was dead, but no body was found in the house at that time. The bodies were eventually found at the residence in an outdoor wash house, though, some years later. At first, Evans claimed that Christie had killed his wife in a botched attempt, abortion attempt, but police questioning eventually produced a confession from Evans. However, it's likely to be a fabricated confession. Evidence was eventually convicted of the deaths. Christie was the main witness who gave detailed evidence about the quarrels between him and his wife. Evans was hanged as a result of this conviction, but he was later exonerated after they found out that Christie had done it. Christie strangled his wife and three more female victims, all by strangulation. He used a similar gassing techniques on his final three victims. As with Edie, his wife, Christie repeatedly raped his last three victims while he were unconscious and continued to do so until they died. When this aspect of his crimes was publicly revealed, Christie quickly gained a reputation for being a necrophiliac. However, this isn't really strictly true as he didn't exclusively engage with the victims after their death. Engaging in sexual activity with the victims as they died means that he enjoyed the feeling of power it gave him. He didn't see these women as individuals. He was treating them as vehicles to obtain something that he wanted, which was, of course, power. This was a man that nobody suspected. He only spoke 
in a very slight whisper and so he never drew attention to himself. In his upbringing he had no power and was made to feel inferior. By gassing, raping and killing these women, he was, in his own mind, being so powerful that he had control of when they died. He'd shown this exertion of power when he convinced Evans that his wife had died from sepsis. He was displaying this power when he stood as a witness in the trial and indirectly caused the death sentence to be given to Evans. The bodies of his victims were only discovered when he moved out and a new occupant found two bodies behind a kitchen wall. On further investigation, the other bodies were also discovered then. Christie was only tried for the murder of his wife, Ethel. Christie pleaded insanity and he claimed to have a poor memory of the events. A prison doctor testified that Christie had hysterical personality, but that he wasn't insane. The jury rejected the plea and found him guilty and he was hanged in 1953. I do hope that you found this psychological analysis of Christie interesting, informative and that you've learned something. This was a man who was suppressed as a child. He was made to feel inferior and he learned that death was a way to exert his power and control over those who he's seen as oppressing him. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.